Ah, Lithuania. Known for... Ah, who am I kidding? No one knows anything about Lithuania anyways. Sveiki at Vike i Lietuva, a country which is apparently situated in the geographical center of Europe, yet no one really knows where it is. So, let's change that. It is located right here in this largest and bottommost country in the Baltics. It's surrounded by Latvia, Belarus, Poland, and even Russia because of this little shit they have right here. And coincidentally, all of these countries have something to do with lovingly conquering Lithuania or being conquered by them. Such was the case with the much larger Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which even a rural American from Minnesota could point out on the map. And that's saying something. Moving on, you might ask, um, why even bother visiting Lithuania? Lol? There's like, there's like nothing there. Here is you. Incorrect. Things to do in Lithuania: eat kebab, box machine, get busy in Palanga. As a nearby living Estonian, I have seen plenty of things in Estonia, and Latvia, but never have I seen anything more in Lithuania other than a lake outside Kaunas. So with that being said. There was one other major reason for my trip to meet up a good friend of mine who I've known for a while. Hi. However, having our homes just a bus ride away from each other, we eventually decided. Not long after, we get greeted by a heavy shower as soon as we drive into Lithuania. Anyway, we entered Konos and the meetup was great success. And then the following day, we went to explore town. Konos, the second largest city in Lithuania, four runs in the Baltics, and the <laughs> European Capital of Culture 2022. Alongside two other cities, which were both the second largest cities in their countries, it's a really interesting place. We begin our journey at the United Square, also known as the University Square, as the University of Konos is located right here. Here lies also the Vitatas War Museum, which it has artillery, it has flag, it has lion, it has flag. There's also a park with statues commemorating the Lithuanian War of Independence. But the history of Konos goes back way more than just 1918, and to explain its history, there's no better guy than Novan himself, who has lived in Konos most of his life, knows a bit about its history, and is also good at war funding. No! <laughs> the city's name Konos has many myths regarding how it came to be. According to the folk etymology, the name arrives from the verb kautis, which means to fight, while other theories suggest it was named after the god Konos. There's another theory from the 16th century that claims to be that the Roman people, not the empire, first settled here under the leadership of Konos, the son of patrician Palamon. The first written records of Konos being mentioned mentioned as a settlement was back in 1030 with the construction of the marvelous Konos castle and after the Teutons stopped raiding the ever-loving Shudas out of it Konos received the Magdeburg city status in 1408 and became the part of Hanseatic League that same year the city flourished in the 18th century and the Lithuanian half the thick Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, but that wouldn't last so long. The city began to flourish once again in the 19th century. It was then that uh, the massive Konos fortress was built, which became the largest in the empire at that point and became great use in World War I. Once uh, the big Russia collapsed, Poland did a chicken huh? wicked takeover of Vilnius, thus leaving Lithuania's quote unquote temporary capital to be Konos. Once the dust had been settled, the city reached its golden age. The interwar architecture can be seen anywhere as you walk down the street. No surprise that at the time Konos became known as Little Paris. The fun wouldn't last long though, as suddenly the commies honorably walked into the Baltics. Shortly after, a certain short Austrian guy decided to start a special military operation in the Soviet Union, and they started using the old fortress for their atrocities. Those actions are now kept in memory at the 9th Fort Museum, where we really wanted to go but we didn't have time to. Anyways, then the Soviets replaced one decade with another and you know how the story goes there. And now as the history lecture is over, let's continue the exploration. First of all is the city's main street, Las Vegas Alaya, or the Liberian Avenue. From there is the old town itself, which dates back mostly to the 15th to 16th centuries. Our next attraction is the somewhat iconic Cathedral Basilica of St. Peter and Paul, which originates back to the 15th century, having a lavish interior. Its tower can be seen poking up from almost any view of the city. Uh, right next to that shows lies the old town square, with the town hall, that looks more like a church, and then an actual church. After that we headed out to the old town, saw some Hanseatic style buildings. You find this old town in the fight destroying building. Very nice. Do recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> 
helicopter, helicopter, para Cooper, para Cooper. And the glorious Nemonas River. From there, we see some monument of a Catholic guy, Maronich Church, and then the unarguably most famous landmark in the city, the Gothic Kaunapilis. Looking back at our history lesson from a couple of minutes ago, the castle was a cornerstone for a city built somewhere in the 14th century. It's no wonder that they chose this specific area for the castle then, as it was right at the conjoining point of the Neman and Neris rivers, which would ultimately guard the capital of Vilnius from the goofy goober outsiders. Shortly after the first records of his existence were written, the Teutonic Knights rushed K and defeated the Lithuanian garrison of 400 men after a month long siege. Soon the Teutons withdrew from the castle, but they would attack it again and again. But after the Teutons got their final ass beating at the Grunwald, attempts to control both Kanos Castle and their own state failed. <laughs> Anyway, from there we go back to the age of the Liberty Avenue. My great Lithuanian knowledge sail summon hopeful with a stands a big Byzantine style church, which is beautiful beyond belief. Now we're on military territory just over there. I'm pretty sure this used to be like the parliament building when Kaunas was the capital, but not anymore. Lo Moving on, there is which is actually one of Kaunas' main shopping centers, but anyway. And then some big arena across the Nyaman on an island. Then there's also the Nemunas Island itself, which is basically just a nice park to hang out at. After that, we've been walking around the Nyaman for over two kilometers. We walk over the Mitadas Bridge to South Bank. Three red cars, three black cars, three white cars, four white cars, five! Five black cars all the way back there. Right, let's go. Okay. Right there is a funicular taking you to an incredible view of the town. At the observatory there is a <laughs> But yeah, that would be Kaunas. Of course there were some other stuff that I wanted to see, but I could always come back to Kaunas, and I for sure will. Next we head to the town of Trakai, around 30 kilometers away from Vilnius. A resort town known for its lovely lakes, peaceful streets and a massive fucking island castle. Inside the castle, first you see many artifacts that got uh, discovered from around the world, as well as uh, some coat of arms and stamps. And then in the second half of the castle there is the mostly Lithuanian and Polish stuff, from both the glory days at the Grand Duchy and the Commonwealth, but also what happened after. For example, at the end of the 18th century, the castle began to fall to disrepair, but as the 19th century started rolling around, some enlightened motherfuckers decided that they should build were equal to good, and thus the island castle began to be written about on numerous occasions, as well as obviously rebuilt as well. In conclusion, the Trakai castle is really great, and I implore you to visit it. I'm not a big museum guy, but this did certainly surprise me. Oh, and by the way, there's another smaller castle known as the Trakai Peninsula Castle. But although Trakai is a town of just 5,000 people today, it has lots more historic things to offer. First of all, the settlement was founded by the mad lad Gediminas, who saw the area as a perfect place to build a new capital, as well as the aforementioned massive fucking castle. So in 13 21, the capital was moved from Kernave to Trakai, but just two years later, that same Madla decided to make this little place called Vilnius, and the capital was moved once again. However, even after the capital was moved, albeit Trakai wasn't the only capital for that long anyway, its culture is well preserved as it reflected all sorts of people groups around the Grand Duchy, which gives its town another reputation, as it was communally preserved and built by various different nationalities Lithuanians, Poles, Russians, Jews, hell, even the Turkic Karaims and Lipka Tatars all called this place home. Evet, bir Türk kardeşimiz. And with that came a new type of cuisine exclusive to Trakai and Trakai only, Kibanai, or Lithuanian Cheburek, which was brought in from the Ukrainian steppes. Since the knights and soldiers who were constantly warring and riding around all over the place needed to sustain both warm food and a fine amount of calories, they prepared this dish, and it's pretty great. But yeah, that would be the small, yet very historic town of Trakai. Next we head to an even smaller, yet arguably even more historically significant town, Kernave. This little settlement of 272 people is an archaeological site, which is today on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Its settlement dates back to the Mesolithic and Neolithic times, when the at that point sparsely populated area received a significant increase in population. In the 13th century, with the founding of the just Duchy of Lithuania, Kernave was founded. Its first record date back to 1279, when it became the seat of the Grand Duke Triadenis, thus also becoming the capital. However, the Teutonic Knights couldn't help but pleasure themselves with constantly sieging and sacking it. All this came to a head when Lithuania got itself involved in a cheeky bricky civil war. They decided to pull a Russia and scorch the shit out of Kernave, leaving the city in a worse state than that of Alitus. <laughs> Jump 
The remaining inhabitants relocated to the top of the hill, where some of the few standing buildings can be seen, just as the St. Virgin Mary Schaplierne church, as well as a statue of some of the country's most significant medieval characters, the Iron Wolf, who we'll get to later, Vitatus the Great, who we'll also get to later, and the Double Cross, or the Cross of Vitis, which is an integral part of the country's coat of arms, coming into use in 1386, when it was used as the emblem of the ruling Chagalonian dynasty, and kept for symbolic purposes afterwards. Then there are the hills of Kername, which, although definitely not very high, are really beautiful. But with visiting all the historic places, we should really take a moment to talk about the complexity for in history. So, uh, in the 11th and 12th centuries, the pagan Baltic Samogitians, Auxitians, Sudovians, and Jukians got tired of being raided and decided to start raiding them right back. So, basically, like Rust players. And in 1236, an hour organized the foreign military defeated the Teutons at Saul. And under the protection of one man, a duchy was established. However, his expansion got too dangerous, so suddenly, a strong alliance with the Duke Poland Italy embraced Christianity so it could ally with the Teutons, but then he got assassinated and the pagan life returned. Soon after, another giga chat called Gediminas ascended to the dukedom, established his own dynasty, which was spread to Poland, Bohemia, and Hungary, and he also founded two capitals. All this time, the dukes begged the pope to let Lithuania reform itself into a Christian country, but what they got instead was constant direct confrontations with the Teutonic Knights. The power struggle between the two of the heirs, Kishtutis and Yugaila, was also heavily exploited by the Teutons, leading to a Yugoslav-style mess within Lithuania. Once Kestutis died in Yugaila's custody, all hell had broken loose. His son, Vitautas, had signed a secret treaty with the Teutons to try to gang up on Ugaila, but this led to a civil war, which culminated in Vitautas II pulling in Italy and joining Ugaila for the sake of Lithuania's survival against the Teutons who were raiding the ever-loving fuck out of their lands. As they were still heavily outnumbered, they agreed to form a personal union with Poland, where Ugaila got baptized and became king of Poland, thus finally Christianizing Lithuania. Once that was all well and good, the two cousins once again waged war, which culminated with an agreement making Ugaila supreme duke and Vitautas grand duke of Lithuania. But with the years to come, Jogaila just stopped giving a shit and became Polish. <laughs> While Vitautas would go on to become Lithuania's greatest leader. Even as he ruled during Lithuania's most turbulent times, he managed to expand it to its peak. Under his rule, they took Smolensk, which is the Black Sea, Dominic affected the Teutonic Order after one battle. And right before his death, which was probably not the Novodos of Vitautas Water or the Rampart Sus, but rather of old age, the Crimean Khanate, Volga Tatar, Pskov, Novgorod, and Moscow would all succumb to his influence. If only Vitautas would have lived a few more years, he could have potentially become the second only king of Lithuania. After his death, though, the Kibanai enjoys seek the closer lines with Poland, as the Lithuanians were threatened with the die. So, the two base countries decided to finally unite, and that they did. Where Poland kinda Romania to the Ukrainian regions held by Lithuania, but yeah, 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 yeah. It wasn't all rainbows and cards for the Lithuanians, though, as heavy Polonization took place and Lithuania became a peasant language. In came 7072, with Russia gaining most of Lithuania and Prussia gaining part of the Niemen South Bank. However, after a minor inconvenience caused by a short Corsican guy, which was supported by many Lithuanians, <laughs> the borders changed. In 1830 and 1863, the Lithuanians joined their Polish comrades in the November and January uprisings. However, based, it ultimately failed. After which, heavy Russification took place. <laughs> Classic. Unlike the Baltic River, and this only strengthened their national revival. The road to autonomy and independence was bolstered by 1917 Light Version, aka the 1905 Revolution, where the Foynes in the Baltics were finally able to learn their languages in their own governorates. In 1915, Germany ate a bit of tartar chocolate and occupied basically all of Lithuania in one summer. After Germans couldn't care less for Lithuania, they let them establish a puppet kingdom. After Germany surrendered, the German puppet government was overtaken by the first national government, which was great and all, apart from the fact that it didn't have a military. Fortunately for them, around 10,000 Saxon volunteers were sent in, and alongside them, Lithuanian Jews and Belarusians too enlisted in the army. It was particularly interesting for the Belarusian case, as they had wanted to form their own country, including Vilnius, but they had gotten steamrolled by the Soviets without a fight, and thus many went to fight for not specifically Lithuania, but for Belarus, as Smetona had promised autonomy for Belarusians in the areas which they would take back from the Bolsheviks in control. And about that, the darn commies had just entered Vilnius. However, the Lithuanians got their shit together and took back most of their land, but then the Poles slid into Vilnius' DMs. But as they were getting the Ukrainian War of Independence treatment, they still emerged victorious, although it could have gone better. Like the Baltics and Poland, they finally too made a coup establishing their dictatorship by Smetona the Kwasaman in 1926. But hey, in exchange for Vilno, they got Klaipeda. Never mind. But hey, in exchange for Memel, they got Vilnius back. Never mind. Then the Germans once again ordered an pan de chocolate and overran Lithuania this time in a week. At this time, a Lithuanian national government was declared, which chased out the Pasky commies. But it wasn't dissolved by the Germans, but rather by themselves.
and then the usual shit. The Germans got a little bit too silly, there were Polish and Soviet partisans, and then in 1944, the Soviets recaptured Lithuania. <laughs> But this was anything but the liberation, as Stalin decided to abracadabra have 780,000 people perished. Out of spite, some force brothers pulled the Vietnam and the Soviets, aka Europe's bloodiest guerrilla war. <laughs> Until the funny trees realized oh. that the short Georgian guy had finally died from skill issue. Huh? Eventually, the bots decided to fuck this and shortly after forming a human chain declared independence on March 11th, 1990. However, the Soviets just couldn't help but oppress Lithuania as much as possible, and with the January events, 720 casualties occurred. The outgunned civilians defeated them, though, and Lithuania independence was restored. Phew! Well, with all that in mind, it's time to go visit the one and only Bill. <laughs> Ej, 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 kurwa, nie, ej, nie zgadzam się, wino jest polskie, nie grzeje piłsudzki. To nie oni myśli, że to jest inny. Come on, open. We arrived in the capital and went straight for the old time. Aj, look at the Vilnius. Okay, it looks nice, I guess. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, the gate's in the door. Wait. Oh. Now, me being a church enjoyer, I visited the first one I saw, and it was pretty great. Something also great was how it literally rained and stopped raining every five minutes like someone was playing with the light switches again. Don't take rain it. I said, what beautiful weather, do you even see the raindrop? Well, I do, and there's a lot of them. Guys, great news, the, it, the rain has ceased. Anyway, after wandering around the quiet side streets, we got to see a big show. So this, this is actually like right here in the, I guess, town square of Vilnius you have, you have the <laughs> this <laughs> Get the death penalty. You have the your favorite clown, Lukashenko. Lukashenko. Oh, my Lukashenko. You have <laughs> Mount Rothmore, Mount oh, Lukashenko. Mount Lukashenko. <laughs> Wait, I just feel like this. 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 Animal planet. Animal planet. Yeah, this one. <laughs> this, this. The Russian way not to rob him. Ah, yes, we need to show this too. <laughs> Then there is Molotov, Cocktail Tank, Baba Ukraine, Babushka Coca Cola. What a beautiful sight in Vilnius. Walking down the streets, I saw a parking spot reserved for Romania, where the car was conveniently non existent. So, a really cool Dominican church, the. Amogus! No, don't take it, don't take it, don't take it! And then we reached another major attraction, the St. Anne's Church. Which from the inside isn't really much, but from the outside, whoo wee! Maravar really is to look at. This Gothic beauty was built for Anna, the Duchess of Lithuania, by Vitautas. I mean, damn, even Simping has to be great for Vitautas to create. There are also some statues on the city's second main river, the Vilna River, across which would lie the strange Ujupis district, which acts as an independent micronation. And I missed out on that interesting place. But hey, I got some real nice shashlikas and oh! And from there was the one and only Cathedral Square. Probably the most famous attraction in Lithuania with the Vilnius Cathedral. It's also the palace of the Grand Dukes of Lithuania and the Bell Tower, all of which is surrounded by some beautiful 18th to 19th century old buildings. And right on top of the square lies what is arguably Lithuania's most significant monument, the Gediminas Castle. At this location, the most famous legend on how Vilnius was founded took place. One day in 1323, the Grand Duke Gediminas had achieved great, great success, success and the animals and decided to stay in the area for the night. Now, he was probably high on Shate Barshai again, but he dreamed of an iron wolf howling with them might have a hundred wolves. Thus the following morning, after asking a wise, mystical magician what that would indicate, the magician answered, build city here. Thus that's what the Duke ordered. The capital was thus moved from Trakai and they named Vilnius after the Vilna river right beside the hill. The castle tower was part of a much bigger fortress around the city. The positioning of Vilnius being in between marshlands and two rivers was pretty ideal, which was proven by the fact that the Teutons failed to capitulate the city in 1390. As it started rapidly developing in the 16th century, many different diasporas moved to the city. Lithuanian, Yiddish, Polish, German, Turkic, basically as diverse as the average within New York City. Vilnius would suffer some setbacks though. With the coming of the deluge, the Russian invasion devastated Vilnius, where the city was burned and looted. Ah, shoot us. Pillaged by the Russians again. Well, at least now I get to live in peace. <coughs> During the Great Northern War, the Swedes raided much of Vilnius's riches in exchange for the bubonic plague, and a number of devastating fires took place in the 18th century. In 1905, the Great Samos of Vilnius greatly contributed to Lithuania's struggle for self determination, and in 1918 became the capital of the puppet kingdom of Lithuania. Until the Reds brought with them a puppet government and set Vilnius as the capital of it. But then, the Pierogi enjoyed 
Cyrus seized the city. After much fighting and pushing the poles back, so it's in the foyer in the peace treaty where the Red Sea is about to defy him. Only for them to have their asses kicked on the Vistula, where Poland once again occupied Vilnius, where it's a puppet republic, and then annexed it into their country. During the interwar, Lithuania would continuously claim Vilnius as but an occupied territory. However, most other countries would continue to recognize Poland's sovereignty over the city. Except for, well, the Soviets, who honorably revved into Poland. Then they offered to give the Vilnius region to Lithuania in exchange for the heavy price of military bases fell to the broom. The Lithuanians reluctantly had to agree, and while they got the pleasure of re-entering Vilnius, they realized that they had just sacrificed their own country. After the end of the one crowd and two onion occupations, what was the Soviet onion? Vilnius rapidly modernized, but that's not what we're gonna go take a look at. Instead, we're going back to its roots. So we made it to another landmark, the Free Crosses Monument. It was built in the 17th century in honor of some Franciscans dying as martyrs on the hill. But it had to be rebuilt as the wood it was originally built out of began to rot. It was in 1916, that's what it did. However, as the Soviets believed in Czech religion, aka atheism, let this Czechy have some of the most cool churches ever, when they're the most atheist fucking country in The crosses were torn down, but thankfully it was re-erected in 1989. On top is a great panoramic view over the city, where you can see everything from the old town to the godforsaken comic block districts. After that, we saw the meeting point of the Vilnia and nearest rivers, some authentic Rimi drip, and the skeleton. <laughs> that, yeah, that'd be Vilnius. A charming city that I will be going back to many a time, as there are some very cool other parts of the cities that I would like to see. From there, we went down all the way south, crossing some preserved cobblestone road, which is an interesting story from the days of the Grand Duchy. Here it is, by the way. And then we reached our final destination, Druskininkai. <laughs> Known as the southernmost town in Lithuania, Druskininka is basically an old spa town 7 kilometers away from the Belarusian border and less than 30 kilometers away from Poland, which is once again located on the Niemunas River. While today it's the southernmost, this wasn't always the case, but if I say anything more, I'm sure to lose all Belarusian and Polish subscribers left on this channel by this point. During medieval times, a small castle was built here, which was, surprise surprise, wiped out by the Teutonic Knights in 1308. As the area was being repopulated in 1636, the first written record of the town suggested that the name derived from the locals collecting pre Precious minerals from the area. In the 18th century, some chemistry nerds from the University of Vilnius found that the local waters included some magic minerals. They also promoted people from all around the nation to come to what would become a nice little resort town. During the Polish interval times, President Piłsudski would spend most of his summer the holidays here. However, after the Polish mustersman died and two mustersmen invaded Poland, the Ruskinikai, unlike Vilnius, was granted to the Belarusian USSR. However, in September 1940, it would be transferred to Lithuania in exchange for Lithuania being transferred to the Soviet Union. After World War II, Druskenikai was bolstered with sanatoriums and spa hotels attracting 400,000 visitors from all over the Union per year. As for the town itself today, there's a main avenue, a nice church, the Australian embassy, some funky hotels, goofy aha, the local Grand Prix, and some big ass festival. Because coincidentally, the very day we were there, a ton of Lithuanians from around the world gathered there for concerts. And then there is the crown jewel of the town, the Druskenikai Water Park, a place filled to the brim with Polish and Lithuanian tourists. But trust me, when you visit it, it seems more like a hidden gem than a major tourist attraction. After my water park experience, we also saw another sanatorium, saw some great local entertainment from afar, what? and that was it. The following day I had another adventure, regarding my travel all the way from the south end of the Baltic states to the north end. First we drove all the way to direct to for 2 hours, then I went goodbye that I got on a bus to Rico for nearly 4 hours, and from there I quickly hopped on a bus that I finally took me to Tallinn. But hey, what can I complain, the bus from Karnas to Riga I took actually came all the way from southwest Germany. But yeah, that be it for Lithuania, who knew that in such a small country lies so much interesting thing to see, eh? And there's a lot more to see. Lithuania is definitely worth checking out in order to see a more peaceful, but certainly not boring, part of Europe. If you learned a thing or two, consider subscribing, and once again I would like to thank my great Lithuanian friend Norvin for helping me with the scripting and taking me around many of these virtually unknown places in the country. Now I will attempt to butcher a Lithuanian sentence. A chu kat a chu kat Created places to visit in Lithuania for tourists, report Craymond, Shilaini Silver City, Naujanai Balkon Tour, Beriunai Bazaar, Rumpiškė Barak Tour, Brooklyn Rayon Kebab Degustation, Mogilovas Gangsta Rep City, Vilnius Totis at Night for Surprise.